All right, I'm going to get started here. I uh, just want to thank Scott Bush and Sabre for having me. I'm really excited to talk about seam shifted wake effect today. So my name is John Garrett, and uh, today, because I've got the animations going there, we're going to be talking about seam shifted wake. So first of all, I'm going to briefly go over uh, my background and then cover some seam shifted wake basics and then dig a little deeper and then uh, have some concluding remarks. So my background, I attended Utah State University studying mechanical engineering. And um, while I was a junior, I took a heat transfer class from Dr. Barton Smith, um, who at that time um, was just starting to research the aerodynamics of baseballs. And he invited me to get involved with his research. Um, and so then I, I started uh, researching seam shifted wake with him um, the summer before my senior year, um, all throughout my senior year, and then all throughout my uh, master's program as well. Um, the summer before I graduated, I graduated in December of 21. And uh, the summer before that, I had a baseball data internship with MLB. Then after I graduated, um, I ended up at Rapsodo because um, they were interested in incorporating the work that I had done on seam shifted wake and seam orientation into their line of ball tracking products. So uh, to start off, we're going to talk about some seam shifted wake basics. And the things I'm going to cover here are the Magnus effect, um, how uh, the pressure distribution looks like around baseballs, um, what we called separation maps, and one of our early tests, which we called uh, the looper test. So we're going to get pretty deep into, into fluid dynamics, but I'm going to try and keep it at a high level. Um, here on your screen, um, you can see a golf ball that is traveling to the left. And uh, this image is uh, particle image velocimetry. So it's showing what the airfield um, looks like around the ball. Um, the colors that you see, the blue and red, um, are showing vorticity, which is air that's spinning. Um, and like I said, this ball is traveling to the left. Um, the point at the front of the ball is a stagnation point, and this is where the pressure on the ball is the greatest. The pressure then decreases as you move around the top and bottom of the ball, um, and you have a point of minimum pressure on the top and bottom of the ball. And then the pressure uh, begins increasing again until the air separates from the surface of the ball and forms the wake. And you can see that with the arrows that are showing where that happens. So we refer to that as the boundary layer separation point. I'm probably going to be just referring to that as the separation point moving forward. Um, but this ball, this golf ball, is not spinning. And you can see that the separation point on the top and the bottom is um, basically in the same place. And <clears throat> the reason why we're talking about pressure distributions at all is because um, forces are the result of the pressure that is acting on the ball. And why do we care about forces that are acting on the ball? That's where the movement comes into play. So just for example, the stagnation point, which I mentioned is the point of maximum pressure, um, the pressure there is much greater than the pressure in the wake. And that's why balls experience drag, okay? So now we have a ball that's spinning. This ball's uh, rotating clockwise and again, traveling to the left. I've, I've marked there the stagnation point, which is the point of maximum pressure, the minimum points. But with the ball spinning, you can see that we uh, the the places where the wake is forming have shifted. So on the bottom, that separation point has moved farther towards the front of the ball. And on the top of the ball, it's moved farther towards the back of the ball. Now, because we have an asymmetric wake here, and we the, the area of minimum pressure on the top of the ball is much larger than the area of minimum pressure on the bottom of the ball. And this difference in pressure then creates a force that is pushing the ball up. And this effect that we're seeing here is what we refer to as the Magnus effect. Now, the Magnus effect is um, well understood. It's been studied for over 100 years. And basically, the takeaway is if you can break the symmetry of the wake, you introduce um, an additional force that's acting on the ball. So spin, uh, which is the Magnus effect, is one way to do this. But in our lab, we found that seams on a baseball can do it as well. So let's look at a baseball. Um, so this baseball is traveling again to the left at 90 miles per hour in our lab in Logan, Utah. And I've again marked the, the regions of very high pressure 
very low pressure. And then again, that wake is at um, a, a constant pressure that's near the atmospheric pressure. Now you can see that this the, the separation points are asymmetric, which we saw on the spinning golf ball on the last slide. Um, but this ball is not spinning. This ball is just traveling to the left at 90 miles an hour. Um, and so what you can see there is that the seam on the top of the ball is causing the wake to separate off of the surface of the ball earlier than it would have otherwise. And so this is what we call the seam shifted wake. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting about baseballs is that golf balls were specifically um, designed for the aerodynamics. Um, the dimples on the ball are designed to keep the, the airflow attached to the surface of the ball as long as possible to limit the drag so that your golf balls fly as far as possible. Now, baseballs were not designed with aerodynamics in mind. And as a result, the aerodynamics of baseball are really interesting. So after taking um, a lot of data, um, <clears throat> the uh, graduate student that I worked with as an undergraduate um, decided to communicate this with what we called separation maps. So <clears throat> this map here that you can see, we've marked which direction the ball's moving. And we have the hemisphere plane, which is perpendicular to that ball trajectory. And the uh, green area that you see is a range of angles where if there's a seam present in that area, it can cause the flow to separate earlier than it would normally. And the red range of angles is where um, if there's not a seam in that green area, um, it's gonna separate in that red range of angles. So after um, looking into a lot, of, a lot of PIV data and coming up with that separation map, um, we decided to, um, to test this out. And we um, launched baseballs across our lab uh, using a pneumatic cannon that was provided to us by Washington State University. And we uh, tracked the trajectory of these balls at pitching distance using a Rapsoda 1.0 product, which if you're familiar, the Rapsoda 1.0, um, it's an optical based system. So it takes images of the ball so you can see how the ball is actually spinning. Um, at that time, it um, predicted how the ball must move based on how it's spinning, which at that time was a totally acceptable um, way to approach it because we, at that time, again, didn't know that there was anything other than the Magnus effect that was um, really determining how the pitch was moving. Um, so we launched baseballs that had uh, the same velocity, um, spin rate, and spin axis. Um, the spin axis that we chose was a vertical spin axis, so pure side spin. And we altered how um, the seams were oriented about that spin axis in our test. So it was called the looper um, because we, um, let's see. All right, so you can see those balls spinning now. Um, so you had a seam where the bottom loop had a seam that was um, basically looping around the spin axis. Um, the top loop had a seam that was looping around the spin axis on the top of the ball. And we saw that the bottom loop um, experienced positive vertical break. Again, this is subtracting out how the ball would fall due to gravity. So it, it didn't fall as far as gravity dictates it should. And the top loop um, fell further than gravity dictates it should. So we expected this based on the results of our PIV data. Um, something, like I said, we, we anticipate this vertical movement. Something we didn't anticipate was the horizontal movement, which would then be in the Magnus direction or in the spin direction. Something else that was interesting as a result of this test um, was that the seam shifted wake movement varied with seam height. Um, so you can see the, uh, the red and uh, blue dots um, were larger seamed baseballs and the green and orange dots, um, which represent the averages, um, were smaller seamed baseballs. So as a result of this test and a result of the work that Andrew Smith did, um, that opened up a lot more questions for me to research in my own graduate research. Um, so some of the things I'm going to be talking about are seam orientation, seam height, uh, velocity, air density, and then seam shifted wake in the Magnus direction. So early on in my research um, collecting data, I came across this um, PIV image, which is showing a seam position 13 degrees in front of that hemisphere plane, um, which um, in this PIV image, it was showing 
that that seam caused advanced separation, which contradicted the separation map that Andrew had um, you know, generated as a result of his research. Something else that was interesting was um, here you have a uh, four seam image and a two seam image. Um, the seam on top is in the same location with respect to the hemisphere plane in both um, at about 9.4 degrees in front of that hemisphere plane. Um, but the four seam um, ball uh, did not cause advanced separation and the two seam orientation did cause advanced separation. So this was showing that um, you know, you can experience a different seam shifted wake effect depending on the ball orientation. So Andrew Smith's sample size for his separation map was 36 two seam PIV images and 24 four seam PIV images. Um, as a result of analyzing more data, I realized that we needed a much larger sample size. And so I collected 463 two seam orientation images and 288 four seam orientations, which due to the symmetry of the baseball, that equated out to 576 four seam data points. And this here is a plot of um, the seam closest to the hemisphere plane and where the separation point occurred on the ball. So that green area is where the separation occurred after the seam. The yellow area is where the separation occurred before the seam. And then that uh, diagonal line in there is where the separation occurred on the seam itself. And there's going to be a lot of plots and tables, and I'm not going to be going into a lot of detail here. Um, you're more than welcome to look at my slides later or um, look at my thesis or an upcoming paper, um, but I'm going to try and keep things kind of high level right here. So here we noticed um, that the range of angles where seams could advance separation was actually larger than we had originally thought. I saw um, that you know, seams were able to advance that separation even as far as 11 or 13 degrees in front of that hemisphere plane. But also what was interesting was that um, the likelihood of that advanced separation varied depending on where that seam was positioned. And this is for a lot of reasons, um, one of which is seam height, and we're going to be getting into that here in a second. But what was also interesting when comparing four seam and two seam orientations was that uh, where the range of angles um, was pretty consistent in that um, the, the seams could advance that separation anywhere from 11 degrees in front of the hemisphere plane to um, 30 degrees behind the hemisphere plane, the likelihood that that seam would cause that advanced separation differed between two seam and four seam orientations. Um, something of particular interest to me at least um, which uh, you can see in these tables, but I'm going to show you on the on the next slide as well, is that in the range of angles from 10 degrees to 30 degrees behind that hemisphere plane, um, I would see about half the time the the flow would separate farther forward on the ball than where the seam was located, and half the time it would separate at that lo at that location of the seam. And so that's shown here in that um, blue range of angles in what became um, a lot more complicated separation maps. Um, so like Andrew's separation map, that green uh, range of angles shows where if there's, a if there's a seam present in that range, it can advance flow separation. I have varying shades of green to denote that the likelihood that a seam present there will advance that separation or not. And that blue range of angles, like I said, is where half the time, if there was a seam present there, the flow would separate off that seam. Half the time, it would separate farther forward on the ball. And what's interesting looking at this um, from four seam to two seam is that obviously for the two seam orientations, um, you have a top hemisphere of the ball and a bottom hemisphere of the ball. And the two seams um, are either gonna be in the top or the bottom. And the hemisphere of the ball that didn't have any seams um, it the, the natural separation point, which is the purple, um, was farther forward on the ball than the, the top hemisphere of the ball. Um, that natural separation point um, was farther back towards the back of the ball than on the bottom. So this just indicates that two seam orientations inherently produce the seam shifted wake effect more effectively than four seam orientations do. So I know that was a lot. The key takeaway here is that Pitches thrown in four seam orientations, two seam orientations, 
or anywhere in between will experience varying degrees of the seam shifted wake effect. Now getting into seam height, um, on the left here, we have a ball that had um, seams that were 22 thousandths of an inch high. On the right, um, that ball, the seams were 45 thousandths of an inch, so about twice as high as the ball on the left. And I've got a series of images here. So um, this uh, seam position, we're looking at the top of the ball. Um, the seams are positioned 14 degrees behind the hemisphere plane. I'm going to be on the next few slides rotating the balls um, to be counterclockwise. Um, and we're going to see that the range of angles where the, the seams can cause that advanced separation is going to change based on the seam height. So we're going to rotate um, forward to negative seven, and the balls are still behaving similarly. Rotate a little bit farther forward. And now on the low seamed ball, that seam on the top is not causing advanced separation but it is on the high seam ball. Rotate farther forward, and again, that low seam ball is not causing advanced separation, but the high seam ball is. Then when we rotate farther forward again, um, now the balls are behaving similarly again. So the one of the big takeaways here is that the seam shifted wake effect may vary from one ball due to the neck, or from one ball to the next due to seam height differences. Um, this is evident in um, the drag studies that, that have been done as well, right? We've known that, um, or we've known recently that drag increases with seam height, and this is why, because the range of angles where um, you can have advanced separation is greater when the seams are higher. Now let's talk about um, velocity and air density. So why are we able to pair these together? Um, fluid dynamics varies with Reynolds number, and Reynolds number is a dimensionless number that allows us to scale fluid dynamics effects. Okay, so uh, a good example of this is testing airplane models in wind tunnels. All right, you're able to put a model in there, see the effects, and be able to scale that to what an actual airplane would experience. And the Reynolds number is made up of the density of the fluid, which in the case of baseballs would be air. Uh, the, the dynamic viscosity of the fluid, which is a property of that fluid, the velocity of the fluid, and a characteristic length of the object that is passing through the fluid, which in the case of baseballs would be the diameter. So all this is to say that um, the data that we're collecting in Logan, Utah, we could then see how um, what the equivalent velocity would be at sea level and in Denver, which are the two extremes as far as MLB ballparks goes. So a 60 mile per hour pitch in uh, Logan, Utah at 4,500 feet um, would experience the same uh, fluid dynamics effects that you would see at 51 miles per hour at sea level and 62 miles per hour in Denver. Um, a 90 mile per hour pitch in Logan would be the equivalent of 76 at sea level and 93 in Denver. And 110 miles per hour in Logan uh, would be the equivalent of 93 at sea level and 113 in Denver. Now these plots I know are, are quite messy and pretty difficult to understand, um, but um, you can see um, in these plots, again, we're, we're plotting the separation location with respect to seam location on the ball. And we've got 60 mile per hour uh, plotted in red, 90 in blue and 110 in black. Um, the big takeaway that I'm gonna just mention right here is that this did show that separation location with respect to seam location does vary with Reynolds number. So saying, um, you know, you can throw a pitch in uh, LA and it's gonna move differently than it does in Colorado. And everyone knows this. Um, this is proof that, you know, of the fluid dynamics that's behind why that's happening. And this will be talked about a lot more um, in an upcoming paper that I'm writing with Patrick Dufour, Erica Francis and Barton Smith. So key takeaway here, again, the seam shifted wake effect varies with velocity and air density and the resulting force affecting the pitch movement will as well. All right, this next um, section, again, I mentioned the looper test earlier had unexpected horizontal movement, which was in the, the Magnus direction. Um, so I collected PIV data at 90 miles per hour and spin rates of 1300, 1800 and 2300 RPM. And as a result of this data, we saw that it did experience the Magnus effect, which 
again, we um, expected. I found a range of angles where a seam can advance that separation, much like when the ball was not spinning. Um, but I also found a range of angles uh, where a seam could delay that separation, which was something that I both wasn't expecting and something that we didn't see um, in the non-spinning data. And um, those two different effects are shown in these images right here. Um, looking at the seam location on the bottom of the ball in each, um, we're on the left. Um, that seam on the bottom is causing advanced separation where the ball is experiencing natural separation on the top of the ball. And on the right, that seam on the bottom is delaying separation um, where on the top of the ball it's experiencing natural separation. And so again, going back to separation maps, um, basically everything's a lot more complicated than we thought. And that's again because um, baseballs weren't designed with the aerodynamics in mind. So these are for the four seam um, orientations. I've got the non-spinning on the left and then 1300, 1800, and 2300. And these are the two seam separation maps. And if I toggle back and forth between the two, you can see that they um, are different, which again, we expected because um, they were different when the ball wasn't spinning. Um, but something that is particularly interesting um, is that when the seams cause advanced separation on the top of the ball, um, that is going to subtract from the Magnus effect. Whereas on the bottom of the ball, if it causes advanced separation, that's gonna to add to the Magnus effect. And if it delays, it's gonna subtract from the Magnus effect. Um, and if you look at uh, the four seam compared to the two seam, the natural separation points um, on the two seam are farther forward on the ball than they are for the four seam. And this would indicate that four seam orientations experience greater lift than two seam orientations do. And this uh, supports studies that have been done by Washington State University, um, as well as a number of other universities. Something else that was interesting from this um, study was that the ability of seams to advance and delay separation disappears at the higher spin rates. Again, I collected data at 1300, 1800, 2300 RPM. So I saw it at 13 and 18, didn't see it at 23. Um, I don't necessarily know what the cutoff is, um, where that effect goes away. Um, but it's somewhere somewhere in between 1,800 and 2,300. Now, the key takeaway here is that uh, this is primarily interesting from a fluid dynamics perspective rather than a practical pitching perspective. And the reason I say that is because um, the range of angles where the seams can cause advanced uh, separation, the ball is constantly spinning through that range of angles. So the pitcher doesn't have control over that. Um, other than by controlling the spin rate itself. Whereas the seam shifted wake in the non-Magnus direction, uh, the pitcher can control that because they can essentially um, pin um, some seams so that they're constantly, or for the majority of the rotation of the ball, they're in that range of angles where they can cause advanced separation. Now in conclusion, um, the seam shifted wake on pitch movement is a function of many parameters. Um, some of those that we talked about are seam orientation, seam height, velocity, air density, spin rate. Something we didn't talk about is the 3D spin axis, um, but this is something that uh, Dr. Barton Smith talked about in his previous Sabre presentation, um, which I encourage you to look into. Um, and there's undoubtedly many more factors that are going into play here. Um, the more we learn in, in the field of science, um, the more questions um, arise and the more things that we have to look into. Um, so this is definitely um, a very new field of research um, that's going to require a lot more, a lot more work. But as a result, um, creating this effect on pitches takes experimentation um, because um, since it is um, a function of velocity, of spin rate, of, uh, of a number of different things, the same orientation for pitches that works really well for one pitcher uh, might not work for another pitcher. And so every pitcher is going to have to learn what orientations get that best movement for themselves. And uh, there's a lot of great products that are coming out on the market um, these days to, to help pitchers in that experimentation. Um, and I mentioned I'm not gonna be talking about Repsoda today, but anyone who's interested, um, I'd love to talk to you about how um, we're incorporating my research into their line of products. So thank you.
And any questions? Yeah. So the C one of data fall into the period of the screen because I'm curious, does that have more information separate ways or does it behave so it's like a continuous version? Um, that's a good question. And we did um, early on in our research, we um, looked at multiple different sports balls. Um, I don't remember the name of this one in particular. Um, it's a sport that I hadn't heard of. I believe it's played in the UK. Maybe someone knows. Um, what is that? Yeah, curling. So um, it has raised seams that um, aren't stitches. It's um, essentially just like a, a rectangular seam that goes all the way around it. Um, and we saw the same, we saw very similar effects on that ball um, compared with baseballs. Um, but there is some interesting work that's being done um, at NASA Langley, actually, that they're doing a computational fluid dynamics analysis um, where they're looking into the differences where, um, you know, the, the position of seams, there's, there's an area where the seam is and then a little gap between each seam. And they're looking into um, the differences there. Um, I will say um, CFD studies um, have their own challenges because baseballs are imperfect because they're handmade. Um, and so they're not perfectly round. Um, there's, you know, some flat spots on some balls. Um, so it's, it's a very complicated analysis to do, but um, there's, there's work being done there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh huh. Right. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. And that is where, you know, a lot of the work that we did in our lab was uh, particle image velocimetry work. And so um, work done in the in the field measuring the whole pitch trajectory. There's a lot of work to be done there. Um, what's really cool about, um, you know, the in-game MLB provider in Hawkeye is that they're measuring that full trajectory as well as um, the spin axis and the seam orientation as well. Um, and so there's a, there's going to be a lot that we're able to learn um, analyzing that data. Um, you brought up something really interesting about really interesting about knuckleballs, though, and that is you know with knuckleballs, the idea is that they're not supposed to be spinning at all, and so you you're going to be throwing it, and the seams are going to be oriented in a way that um, it's going to create that seam shifted wake effect. That's going to apply a force on the ball. That floor that force is going to put a torque on the ball. So then the ball is going to you know rotate slightly. And now there's going to be different seams in that position that's going to create a force in a different direction. And that's why you have that erratic movement on knuckleballs. One more question. Um, we've got one on the chat here. Um, have you also done research on the force on the ball from all around the ball and not just the top and bottom of the ball? If not, why? So that's a really good question. Um, our particle image velocimetry work, um, we're able to see just one plane of that air that's flowing around the ball. Um, and so undoubtedly, um, you know, the, the position of the seams and the other planes could have an effect on that. Um, that is something that we're very interested in doing. And that's why research like, um, you know, CFD studies is very valuable, although it does, you know, have its own challenges. Um, something that I think would be really interesting is um, 3D PIV studies, which um, does show that whole volume of the fluid flow um, that is really expensive. And unfortunately, um, there's not uh, a lot of people who want to pay for that kind of research, but very interesting. So that's all the time that, that I have, but happy to talk um, later on today or tomorrow with anyone else who's interested. So.